But um, the first day of uh, the um, demonstrations, um, like a young uh, man, Komet Zamahoro, was killed. Mm. He was uh, 16 years old and he wasn't even protesting. And uh, that's something that really affected me. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I think that since we live together, you know, that when it's that date, I'm, I'm pretty mad when... Uh, when yeah. I just remember, um, you know, it's something that really affected me that a young uh, man of 16 years old who wasn't even protesting who was there and uh, could be shot dead mm -hmm. while kneeling and shot by um, the police. Mm -hmm. That's something that really affected me and uh, it didn't stop uh, from that moment. Um, from that day one, the police was shooting on uh, young people and uh, really brutalizing them. Hi and welcome to The Feminist Family. I'm Corey. I'm Pamela. Yeah, and that's it. We are the feminist family. Yeah. So uh, we don't have a, a big plan for today's show, so I was just going to ask Pam some questions uh, about her past and her life and, and see where we go from there. Do I have the option to not respond? Uh, it's up to you. Okay. I'm not going to force you to do anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess I uh, obviously... You're from Burundi, mm -hmm. um, so but you went to school in Belgium. Yes. And what did you take in, in school? Communication. Okay, and what does that mean? A lot of things. <laughs> 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 uh, it means that I was trained to um, become a technician in uh, communication. That means that um, I know how to uh, make, like, communication tools like uh, to treat um, either pictures, videos, or um, um, do, I don't know, all the printings. And I also was um, taught how to write uh, for different purposes. Okay. Uh, also journalism, including journalism. Okay. Yeah. So like you could write a news story. Exactly. Or like a press release. Yes. Or okay. I can be behind the camera. I can also do the editing. Okay. I can play with the sound. So, so that all sounds like stuff that a person would be specialized in. Like, is that not a thing that you specialize in? Like, or is communication cover all of it, and then people sub sub specialize? Okay, um, I would say that we are introduced to uh, many things, and during the three years that you are studying, um, you are. Um, like doing internship okay. uh, in companies and basically you um, you choose what you want to learn and um, it's mostly like when you go for those internships that you're going to be trained like um, okay. uh, on the field that you want. Uh, that means that we all do the three years but at the end of the three years we are not um, sort of specialized in the same things mm, even mm. though we were in the same classes so yeah like it, wherever you did your internship or whatever that yes. would be where you end up specializing then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay and then you were so did you go right into journalism after uh i would say that it's it's again uh regarding the internship mm -hmm. um i uh did my first um internship at uh, um a, a press house in Charleroi, uh, in Belgium. Uh, for, that was just uh, pretty short. Uh, it's mostly observation because it's the first year you, you're just still learning. And from the second year, I, I did all of them in uh, television. I, they are, my teachers approved that I stay in uh, television um, because before I went to uh, studying communication, I had been working uh, for um, I don't know n eight nine years <laughs> in communication so they were like okay um, I, I picked basically one thing that I haven't worked in and that was available at that moment and it was television and okay. it was pretty good because um, uh, as soon as I finished to do my uh, first internship 
Uh, I did two of them in a second year. Uh, they started to hire me. So I was working on the weekends there. Okay. Um, so it was pretty good. I loved it. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You said, so that was the three years that you were yeah, doing Yeah, three that? years. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you went back to Burundi? No. At some point? No. When did you go back to oh, Burundi? Oh, um, uh, I finished in 2012 and two years later, that's what I went back. Uh, yeah, yeah, 14. That's what I went in Burundi. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what, what made you go back? Um, okay. I need first to tell you that I was married before I left Burundi ah, to Belgium. Yes. Right? right. And uh, later we um, decided to split. So we got separated in uh, 2012, I guess. Okay. And um, I knew that I wanted to leave uh, Belgium. I had in mind three countries. Um, There were Canada and um, Holland and Burundi for really three different uh, reasons to Mm. go there. And um, I didn't know which one to choose. Basically, like two weeks before uh, leaving Belgium, I knew that I was leaving, but I didn't have yet my ticket. I didn't know exactly where I was going. Mm. And then I decided to go to Burundi. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so then in Burundi, were you a journalist there? No. What did you do At there? that moment, I thought that I wasn't anymore a journalist. Okay. Yes. I... Um, I, at that moment, I thought that, you know, I didn't want to be anymore a journalist, but maybe not that much because I later became, <laughs> like, again, a journalist. But um, I, when I decided to go uh, to Burundi, I had in, in mind that um, I was going to um, see any area that uh, I would be working in. All I wanted to to do at that moment was to contribute to uh, building the country basically that's the idea I had in my mind I was like I am gonna go there anyway I didn't have like something really fixed that I wanted to do to do Um, I was like I will go there talk with people and the first idea that we grow from there that's what I will do and so that's kind of when you built the community center Uh, yes yes okay Um, that was in uh, in the um, neighborhood where uh, I was born, where I grew up. Um, I knew that anything that I would be doing in Burundi, I wanted to do that um, in where I grew up. And, okay. uh, you know, when you live uh, out of your country for a, for a moment and you're seeing so many things and you're like, okay, I need to contribute. But, you know, I, okay. I want to do that um, at, from a place I know. Mm. So I was like, okay, I went to um, my dad. I was living at um, his house. We, um, uh, we we built like a small studio yeah. <laughs> around his house. And I was living there and uh, talking with uh, everyone. And that's how the idea of um, um, starting a, a, a cultural center uh, started to grow. And it was pretty exciting. And it was, um, we called it Midway. It's, uh, Midway is we meet in English, but in Kirundi, Midway means like ideas. And it was like the first Burundian uh, cultural center. And we were like, we need to make people meet. And as they meet, as we meet, we're going to be exchanging ideas and uh, be working together and build from there something pretty new and that's the spirit that we were doing all the time that we had the cultural center it was very exciting as yeah. an experience yeah how did that transition into like uh the activism that ultimately made you have to flee the country uh i would say um it was a, a pretty hard um moment at that moment you could feel that something was about to happen um that there were a sort of revolution that people were pretty tired of uh, mm. what was happening there uh, politically 
and um, the poverty, like no jobs and the corruption. And and then the president um, at that moment, Pierre Nkurunziza, decided to uh, run uh, for a third mandate. Mm. At that moment, I was like, okay, but uh, he should not do that. But at the same time, I was like, um, you know, it's... It's something that's going to be more uh, political, right? Mm. Uh, maybe the opposition needs to find like uh, someone to uh, run against him, and where they will be voting mm. for him mm-hmm. or something. I, you know, um, but at the same time, uh, we didn't have much hope that if there were election, um, that is the kind of like a, it would be the kind of like a election that's uh, fair, mm. where mm. really. It's the people who are gonna be pronouncing themselves on who they want them right. to be the president because they were, it was pretty corrupted and uh, the last elections before that uh, it was also like a catastrophe. Is there is there like any reason why a person wouldn't go for a third third mandate? Like, does is that a like it's a illegal constitution? Or? Yeah, it's uh it's uh based on the constitution and okay. every country has its uh it's a con- constitution. And uh, later, uh, civil society, some organization of, from the civil society, they they uh, challenged that third mandate after okay. he got it uh-huh. by force. Okay. Uh, they challenged it in uh, um, East African uh, courts. And the East African court decided that that third mandate was, un- was unconstitutional. Okay. So they so. were challenging it th- through the law. Um, but at that moment in 2000. Um, uh, 15, um, like opposition uh, par- uh, p- parties and uh, also um, civil societies called the people to go in the street and protest against okay. that um, third mandate. Uh, at that moment, I had a baby, I had Shiki. <laughs> she was two months, uh, she was one month when, you know, uh, they went in the street. And I was like, you know, that's not my, my place. I was like a uh, New mom. I'm right? just a new mom. It's pretty tough. But um, the first day of uh, the um, demonstrations, um, like a young uh, man, Komeza Mahoro, was killed. Mm. He was uh, 16 years old. And he wasn't even protesting. And uh, that's something that really affected me. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I think that since we live together, you know, that when it's that date, I'm, I'm pretty mad when uh when yeah. i just remember um you know it's something that really affected me that a young uh, man of 16 years old who wasn't even protesting who was there and uh could be shot dead mm-hmm. while kneeling and shot by um the police mm-hmm. That's something that really affected me, and uh, it didn't stop uh, from that moment. Um, from that day one, the police was shooting on uh, young people and uh, really brutalizing them. And um, I s- noticed that, you know, uh, those people that were wounded or those that were arrested, that, you know, they needed uh, some stuff that weren't there because... Um, most of the organization from the civil society and the opposition parties that called for mm. the demonstrations, uh, most of their leaders were already targeted. Okay. But more than, you know, individuals, and most right. of them were already hiding or had already fled. Right. And, uh, I really joined the streets, um, first of all, um, thinking that it was just to help, uh, you know, uh, help get those who are wounded, get the treatment at okay. the hospitals, yeah. get those who are uh, who have been arrested, um, get something to eat, and uh, so and so, you know, and every single day I, I became more and more, like, uh, uh, involved in those uh, demonstrations. And then um, uh, another friend of mine, Katie uh, Nivia Randi, um sent to us women uh, a message saying, okay, we need to go to demonstrate as well mm. and support the young people because it was mostly uh, young people in the streets and we need to go as women and girls and ask that they stop shooting them, you know? Right, yeah. And that's how we organize the demonstrations and that's what um, 
led to me having to flee um, the country because mm-hmm. uh, there were a, a coup d'etat uh, that failed. And that the day of that coup d'etat, it was uh, one of the days uh, like where we women, we were in the streets. And um, after I've been accused for organizing the, that coup d'etat, which I was against, <laughs> uh, it, it was like a... I had my pictures on uh, all social media. At, at that moment, you know, it was um, uh, the day of the coup d'etat or the next day, uh, media were burned mm. uh, uh, or shut down. And um, social media were mostly what where the news were oh, coming yeah, from, yeah. Uh, not anymore from uh, the, the media. And I saw my picture and my name everywhere and... Um, I was like, I guess it's time, it's time to go <laughs> so, <laughs> with the kids. So you said you were against the, the coup. Mm-hmm. Uh, why were you against the coup? Um, if uh, it was an illegal third mandate, then what, what made you be on the opposite, not quite the opposite side of those who were op- opposing it? Yeah, uh, it's because... For me, coup d'etat, uh, like, uh, come with trauma. We got, um, uh, when I was born, they've already, uh, been like a, a coup d'etat in Burundi. Right. Before I was born. And that was pretty cat- catastrophic after independence. Right. That's how, independence. that's how the Hutus got into power? Uh, no. No? I was that born was, when uh, no, it was a Tutsi on power. No, okay. And, <laughs> And then uh, it changed. I got uh, my first, um, my first, no, my second coup d'etat after I was born. <laughs> I was ten years old, and that's when the um, the newly elected president, who was Hutu, oh yeah, um, uh, has been killed. Oh yeah. So first of all, coup d'etat for me were like a, it was a trauma. Uh, right. I was like a, mm, you know, I. These things never go well. Everything that I heard about the, the coup d'etat, I, I always thought that it was um, um, like a small group of people who decide that they have the best ideas and they're doing that for the country and they're doing that, you know, everybody going to be happy. And for what I understood at that moment about all the coup d'etat that have been uh, happening, it's not like everybody was happy. Yeah. It's, it's well, false, you know, it's... I always think of a coup, like a real coup, not a revolution. Mm-hmm. I always think of a coup as like the military deciding that they know best. Mm-hmm. It's not even like citizens that are like, yeah. who have like, you know, convinced a decent amount of people to overthrow the government. It's usually the military. It's always has been the military. In so then it, it was like a... How much, how much do people trust the military to do the right thing when they become the government? <sighs> I, so at that moment in 2015 in Burundi, uh, I got how many coup d'etat? I got one in uh, 87 when it was Buyoya, and then in 93 when it was uh, uh, that day who been uh, uh, first Bagaza, and then that day, and then after that day um, we got uh, Nagamira. The Burundian president who been killed with the random. Okay. Which also is a coup d'etat. Mm-hmm. And after him, we had uh, Nima Nunganya. They've been a coup d'etat again. Like in 2015, that was only my fifth coup d'etat. <laughs> so. <laughs> Seems excessive. And I was like, um, so suppose- first of all, coup d'etat wasn't something that I had in my mind. Right. And we heard that there were, uh, you know, people were talking that they, there was something that been uh, organized. And when I heard about that, I was like, I hope that they're not doing it. Because honestly, we people in the street, I believed that the street were going to, uh, like, force the president to resign. I found that, you know, I found that to be more interesting that right. the street pushes the president to resign. Mm. than a bunch of, you know, a group of a military who come and... Uh, I'm, I, I, I wonder, like, yeah, because did it seem like the street, the people in the street was going, like, did it seem like it was working? Uh, really, I believed it. And uh, that same day of the coup d'etat, when uh, we were in the street, um, 
based on the meetings uh, that we had uh, the day before um, and the progression of uh, because we had like a um, different groups of uh, young people coming from uh, like four places and we the women were downtown okay and the place uh, where we were we were um, in front of a gas station okay and did you know that is a security gas station in that situation of a coup d'etat gas gas station was pretty good because the danger for us were, were to be shot mm -hmm. but at the gas station the, we were like the police gonna have to be you know shooting us somewhere where you know it's gonna stay in us because it's if it goes if through it goes and blows through, up the gas station everything is gonna be <laughs> bomb. it's gonna right. be more because so even themselves they could be you know in trouble yeah, for sure so we the women were in the in the in downtown in the street and we were calling we were we, we said um the day before that we're gonna make everything possible so that we stay uh downtown until uh 12 uh, 1 p.m because at that moment um that's what uh, uh, media um, in the country were uh, um, doing their news uh, okay. edition. And then our plan was that we would be calling everybody to come in the street. Okay. We would be there. Because uh, uh, they've been at that moment, protestation since uh, like, um, uh, like 20 days. But where it's happening like uh, uh, in um, neighborhoods, but not, and the goal was to go in downtown. Okay. Don't ask me why. <laughs> it looked like the goal was for all the groups to come down, downtown. Okay. And we still don't know why. What was the scenario? Because again, we are not the it's one. It's not who the epicenter the, of like where the president is or like there's nowhere like there's it's a. a it's a, it's really hard to say at that moment because, um, even during that time where there were a procession, um, people could leave those neighborhoods and come to walk downtown. Oh. So it's not like the city was closed. Right, right. You weren't like, the protests weren't impeding. They were just regular. happening out of oh. uh, downtown. Huh. And we were like, why? If the goal is to go downtown, then let's go downtown. Right. That's what we said with women. And that's what we did. Okay. So... Um, uh, when it was like a 12, I was very happy because we talked through the radio and we were in touch with uh, all the groups coming from, uh, you know, we knew that they were progressing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I believe that we were doing it. I was like, everybody who, who is now downtown, they heard that we women, mm. just women, that we did it, that we are in the street and we called all other women, we called like all the men. We were like, okay, now enough with the neighborhood. Y'all come here downtown. We're waiting for you. And so then it's not. I like... thought that it was happening. Okay. Because at that moment, the president of Burundi was uh, wasn't in Burundi. He was participating in a um, in a uh, international conference where okay. he was with other president of the uh, also East African community, and. In our dream, it was like a all other president gonna at a certain moment tell him, "Hey, shh, look at the TV. What's Your happening? People are there? not happy. They are all <laughs> in the street. That's what's really you I, have. Yeah, you have yeah, a mass yeah. protest on your hands here. Exactly, right? yeah, okay. exactly. And then, um, and then, I, I I don't recall exactly what was the signal or what was. I remember that it was like something that came. I've, Paralyzing me. Mm. We were like a women. Uh, the the police uh, around us, because sometimes we will be talking with them, and also uh, there are the people looking at us. There were many people in the street, and then suddenly all these people were like, "Wow, happy!" Okay. And they said, "Coup d'état." Mm. I was like. <sighs> I still don't know even how to process that. Mm. What I felt at that moment, because um, we were in the street saying, hey, police, hey, government, stop shooting the kids who are just asking for the respect of the Constitution. Mm. They have the right to go and express right. what they think about uh, the Constitution that is being violated. But then somebody but goes. Then, then they were so happy that mm. they were a coup d'etat, which I consider to be a violation. But... 
what do I do? I had uh, my megaphone in hand. Right. And I was like, no, no, stop, stop being happy. How do you tell people stop being happy when they are dancing, when they are excited? They took just my uh, megaphone and everybody went as if they were going to celebrate. I was just kneeling in the street. I was like... I wanna go yeah. home. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, why? Because I don't know. Um, I still believe that at that moment, that's where everything was down. Well, but that didn't, yeah. and that didn't end well, right? Like, no. ultimately, that coup d'état. Yeah, it didn't. Uh, it, it didn't happen as uh, those who, uh, who prepared it uh, wanted. Yeah. So it failed. Yeah. So the president came back home in mm-hmm. the country. And the repression was like a... a Ten pro- times worse. Yes, exactly. So um, uh, then they went after the people who finally violated the constitution because he just said that he was running, but those who violate, that's that's how they reacted. And that's, mm. unfortunately, that's also how I see it. It's, mm. It was a pretty... It's one of those, it seems, strikes me, I mean, whether one agrees with the coup d'etat or not, it's one of those... Uh, like it reminds me of the the phrase: If you're gonna come at the king, you better not miss. Like you gotta, if you're gonna do a coup, you better succeed, or else you're yeah. gonna be killed, right? Yeah, exactly. And the repression was a, uh, like the next day there were like uh, three media that were shot, Holy burned. Shit. Yeah. Um, from that moment, you know, there were a. Uh, uh, Police entering in uh, those neighborhoods and uh, right. going uh, after the young people that were there because now those that were in the, in the street were kind of like associated to that coup d'état. Right. Yeah. The two were connected, even though they ne- weren't technically connected. Yeah. Exactly. And um, and we are many that had to flee mm. uh, out of fear for our. Uh, on security, especially those that were in the street. For sure. And and then the um, the police kept shooting people, and uh, it, it got worse. Of course. I mean, and geez. they they tried some some tried to steal the the position, but they were they were at that moment, you know, it, it was with everybody shut yeah, down. with everybody fleeing and many people dying. We, it's pretty hard to maintain something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. At that moment, um, they were talking about like a, we were more than two hundred uh, thousand people that fled at that wow. moment. No, we were many. Like that's wild. Yeah, that's a lot of people mm-hmm, to be fleeing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, at that moment, we had like a uh, more than two hundred and fifty journalists outside. I wasn't a journalist at that moment right. anymore, but you know, journalists once always, you know. Yeah. Uh, there were like uh, more than two hundred. Um, and 50 journalists that that had to flee at that moment. It was pretty intense. Yeah. And so then you went to Rwanda after that? Yeah, I went to Rwanda. Um, uh, and I stayed there for, uh, I would say, 10 months in Kigali. So, yeah. So then uh, what did you do while you were there? How did you survive? Friends. Yeah. Uh, or the money I already had on my account. Mm. Um, yeah, friends all over the place. And... Yeah, they were uh, because um, I could not work. Uh, only in Rwanda, I think that we were more than eighty thousand uh, of us oh, wow. just arriving there. You know, uh, and also add to that all the trauma um, of uh, when I fled. Uh, Shiki, she was like a. Uh, two months right. and, and, and half, you know. Uh, so she was pretty young. Uh, and, you know, it's Rwanda and Burundi are almost the same country, but it's not our country, you know. Mm-hmm. We, it's not like we had even the right to go and work there and work and do what. Anyway, right, you know, right. you don't have the work permit. And um, we are so many refugees, <laughs> right? Like at, at that moment, we were not even thinking about working. Right, you're just you trying know, to get you away. You just need to find like yeah. a house where you're going to be. Uh, you need a house. You need to get your things uh, set it. And uh, refugees were arriving day after day. We didn't know if, uh, you know, when I, when I had to flee, uh, we had to keep in mind that uh, eventually even my family going to have to flee at that moment. You know, it was, um, a, you know, 
a between yeah. season, like in life, where you like uh, the goal was just to survive the day, basically. Yeah. And, uh, don't crack down. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, yeah. yeah. So then, after being in Rwanda, why didn't you go? Because you had a Belgian passport. Mm-hmm. So why didn't you go to Belgium? Uh, I don't know. I I knew I, I when I left Belgium. Okay, I didn't know that it would take me this long mm. before going back. No, this I didn't know because if, if I knew, I would have never left Belgium, <laughs> you know. Um, but living in Belgium, uh, it was something that, you know, um, I love Belgium, but I wasn't seeing myself having uh, going there with a, with a kid. Okay. Uh, I have uh, many relatives in, uh, in Belgium and... Uh, while I was living there, um, I observed so many issues with mental uh, health. Oh, okay. Uh, we, uh, you know, as immigrants um, in in Belgium and in kids, I got mm. nephews who got, uh, uh, you know, hospitalized. Oh. Um, because of that, um, like three of them actually. Mm-hmm. Just thinking about it, it was something that. I don't know. Uh, when I was living in Belgium, my at that moment, my uh, biggest fear were to be come depressed and be of any help. That's that's something I had uh, in my mind um, because of racism, because of sure. uh, how it is. It's a nice country, beautiful country. Mm-hmm. I miss it a lot. But um, even though I was a Belgian, it's not like a, it's not like being a Canadian, you know. Um, here is an immigrant country, right? Yeah. Uh, if it's not only like the First Nations, the other people, I'm like, we all are immigrants, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. But um, something that I felt all the time in Belgium was like, okay, even though I'm Belgian, I'm second zone Belgian. Mm. It's a, there's something reminded you that all the time. Oh, okay. And that's not something that uh, I was like, uh, I knew that I didn't want to be with a baby in Belgium. I was like, I don't want to be with a, with a kid there. Right. And, um, and I was like, also, I had the three countries in my mind when I left Belgium. So I was like, next going to be um, Canada more than Holland because okay. Burundi was done and that so was you, like a... So you don't... did it, You haven't found the similar situation to in Canada that you found in Belgium? Uh, no. I don't think it's uh, it's the same. Okay. No, no. It's, a, it's really not the same. Um, it's, not, it's not the same dynamic, right? Yeah. I mean, the, Belgium is a much older country. It's a much older country, but it's also a country that has a um, a huge history of colonization. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Where Canada uh, con- is conflictual history. Going. Yeah, <laughs> it's a conflictual uh, country. You know, um, for example, uh, in Brussels, you would see uh, Congolese people fighting uh, Rwandan people. No. Oh. Bel- Belgian colonized as all, but right. you would see them fighting, and uh, sometimes the Congolese were uh, uh, fighting Burundian as well. Um, so there is this immigration, you know, Belgium and all the countries that is colonized, and Belgium, uh, white and black, and mm. um, the language. There oh, are yeah. three languages in Belgium. And there is there are some many di- subdivision, but somehow each time as black person, I always find myself like a I don't know. It's not my place. Like mm. I was um, working at a television, as mm-hmm. I said, when I was uh, uh, studying, and w- as soon as I finished my uh, uh, yeah the, my degree of three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, before even the graduation, uh, I started to, um, I was a news anchor at the TV, which I found as just a regular job, right? But uh, in Belgium, I was the first black person to present the news in television because 
in television, black people talk about Africa or sport or African oh, culture. Oh, okay. They don't do the news. No. <laughs> <laughs> seems, seems like which, a silly... <laughs> the, which, um, you know, uh, I got invited at many places, really, to either represent the TV or represent even uh, Burundi. You know, it was a thing. It was a... I think right. as a title, you know, the mm. first black. Actually, I'm the last one too. <laughs> For real? Like they don't have one now? No. That's really wild. Yeah, right? That's pretty wild. That's not something you may see here in Canada, the first uh, black. Well, I mean, uh, there had to be a first. Yeah, there had to be a first, but it's not me. You know, it's yeah. it's usual and like uh, to be... I, to to be the last too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, there was something like that, you pretty know. Strange. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty strange. And, uh, uh, I wasn't targeted like, uh, by racism, but I guess I, f- I feel it mm. naturally because oh. of how I feel, you know, I'm yeah. against injustice, I'm against all the stuff. So I feel injustice. Yeah. I feel racism if I'm seeing it. And, um, it's fair. And and you don't. It it strikes me as odd actually that you wouldn't have that same. At least maybe it wouldn't be the same, but like that you still feel that in Canada. Um. No, I you don't feel it. No. No, there, it, it doesn't mean that there isn't racism. Of course, there's it's lots of racism. Pretty, uh, it's pretty different. <laughs> okay. Uh, sort of uh, racism, yeah. Um, because like um, no, it's. It's not that apparent. How to say? Um, in Belgium, when you when I was living there, um, people who had like seventy years mm-hmm. old, they visited eventually black people in the zoo in Bruxelles. Right, that wasn't a thing that existed here. Right. Yeah. So, to the best of my knowledge, I, I guess I can't speak to 100%. But. So, the, the history is still there, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, so many things that are not solved. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. And you can feel it um, as, you know, here, if someone asks me, like, uh, where are you from? I can say, oh, if you ask me where are you from, I can say, oh, I'm from Burundi. How about you? Mm. You know? Right, right. Yeah. And because we all have a history of yeah, uh, even uh, immigration. Who, that's right. Yeah. And the First Nations in Canada are sort of in minority. Right. Which is not, it's not the same in Belgium. Right, yeah, because the you people know. who grew up in Belgium, whether it was always called that or not, have all, like, their generation after generation after generation. And it's a, it's a, it's a pretty old country yeah. where history is there. Yeah. And so, um, so present and huge. Yeah. You know, when you are, um, seeing like, uh, you go to the city hall and uh, it's been built since 400 years. Right. You know, they have <laughs> <laughs> those kind of, <laughs> And you're like, who am I in this? Like, right, <laughs> I'm still, right. will I have my place? Like, uh, it was something like that. I'm not going to say, honestly, that I was the person who got the most, you know, uh, mm. exposed to racism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would see it. Right. I would see it and, um, and you see it like uh, every single day. Yeah. Yeah. It's another culture compared to Canada and um Right. It also is the sexism. Yeah, that's the thing. It is the sexism a here is hidden. Is it? Here? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, never when I'm going in the street am I hearing people saying, Hey, uh you miss stop. Well, like, that's because we're in Saskatchewan, rather. That's I'm, I'm sure, I think that happens. I know th- there are things that I don't see here <laughs> that you know. If you are in Belgium, that's like every single day. Yeah. You know, uh, it, the, the, it's there. It's the, the, the sexism, racism. Uh, mm. um, sometimes even xenophobia, right? Sure. With all the talking regarding um, immigration. Right. You know, and uh, where you're going to be feeling that... Uh, you know, when we're talking about immigration, um, it's mostly a color thing. It doesn't mean yeah, that yeah. a person who's coming from somewhere else, you right. know. Um, 
No, for sure. I mean, it's like like the situation with Ukrainians being welcomed and, and paid for when they come to Canada. Yeah. And then people from Palestine, they got to pay 5000 bucks just to get, you know, the right to come here. And then they have to pay their own plane tickets and all this. Like mm-hmm. it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it's really something that uh, I love a lot. Belgium, I miss it, by the way. I cannot wait to go to, to the Belgium. Um, there is a lot I love uh, in Belgium, but um, I really didn't want my kids to uh, to grow up there. Right. Um, when it was about kids, uh, I think that I had a sort of like a love for Canada. Mm. Uh, it's not like I, ha- I knew a lot mm-hmm. about Canada. I had this fixed idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, as most people seem to. Yeah, I it, for me Canada is. Um, I got I got an interesting conversation with uh, with uh, my philosophy teacher in uh in, in Belgium, and um, she told us that uh, in Belgium um, in Canada, uh, they sort of like do philosophy on kids like since kindergarten. Mm. I was like, you mean that kids are authorized to ask questions? Sort of. I haven't seen and any. And not just um, learn. I haven't seen any can, elementary school philosophy courses, but. But it's something that is in the culture here. More so, yeah, maybe. You know, um, it's something that, you know, here they. they I, I think I saw it too uh, on the kids. Yeah. You know, that they, uh, they encourage really um, kids to question things and uh, to learn by themselves, you know, mm-hmm. uh, do researches, you know. Right. And I was like, that's pretty great. That's yeah. what yeah. brought me here in Canada, basically. Oh, I was good. like, uh, yeah, I found it. And knowing that it's a country of immigration, I was like, there is a chance that, you know, you, you can become whoever you want. You can uh, run for your uh, your dreams. and Sure. Yeah. And that's, I mean, we know, like, multiple mm-hmm. people from various backgrounds who uh, who are, like, Running businesses, running mm-hmm. for political office, mm-hmm. doing this and that and the other thing. Yeah, you can be. That's what I love really with uh, with Canada. Uh, if I say like, a, can you imagine a, a teacher, oh, a, a bus driver, public bus driver who has like a the the, the thing the Indian. Uh, oh, like the the Sikh. Yeah. Turban. You will, you will never see that in Belgium. Oh no. Mm-mm. Hmm. Okay. Mm-mm. They are. Uh, <laughs> if uh, you're gonna be showing like your religious sign, no. Really? Yeah. Is but, uh, is Belgium a religious country? Uh, it used to be. Okay. It's not anymore. Um, but they 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 have a. Uh, you can see the traces of that. You know, mm. uh, they have like political uh, party that are like a Christian. Oh yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean. Those are all over the place Values. these days. Um, but they're not practicing much, okay. uh, like Catholics or uh, no, not really much. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Used to. So, I guess where do I want to go with this? I was trying to think of like uh, some of the your experiences and how they inform your perspective on on. Canada or Canadian politics. I guess this is where I was going to go. Because you often, we often talk about politics in our household. And I complain about Canadian politics. A lot. A lot. Because it's garbage. Mm-hmm. And, and often, you will bring up the things that you see from Burundi. Mm-hmm. And, and what do I tell you? <laughs> that I shouldn't complain about Canadian politics. And so, in that sense, I, I guess, how do you see the differences between them? Like... What, why do I, why should I complain less about Canadian politics when you see your, the politics from Burundi? Uh, first of all, you can complain about the Canadian politics. Of course I can. Yes. I'm not that, going, that's I'm a never privilege that we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> that's a privilege that we don't have. Um, in my country, you cannot complain about uh, the, right. the politics um, because, like, uh, since the independence, basically, um, Everyone that comes, that's on the power, um, they're like a small god. Yeah, no matter um, who it is, eh? 
we have laws of the country, but the laws are read uh, based on, you know, who is punishing who. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be innocent or uh, be guilty depending on who is accusing you, not based on the law of our country. Right. Um, I don't think that we have like a um, journalist who are uh, uh, obliged to be refugees in Canada. Yeah, not really, no. I mean, you get some people who would act as if they are being targeted in that way. Yes. But it not really. Like, you can... Uh, there's not literally journalists being arrested just for the things that they put in print, right? You can even insult uh, oh, sure, the prime sure. minister. You can even uh, like uh, pay an, a place of advertisement to insult the president. You know, yeah. uh, and compared to my country, you cannot even bring a constructive criticism. Right, right. Critic, you know, yeah, like there's people and, who like uh, literally like they'll post on social media about how much they wish the prime minister would die. Yeah. But you can't do that in Burundi. No. Which I guess because uh, you have a friend in prison. Yes, many. I have many yeah. friends. No, no, maybe you hear me more uh, talking yeah. about uh, um, the journalists. Yeah. Oh, actually, now there are three journalists in prison, and one of them, uh, one of the journalists being killed. Mm. And, um, yeah, uh, I learned that there were another guy who was in, uh, in prison. He's considered also as a journalist. Even though he was a pretty uh, ethnicist. Oh. And, uh, yeah, pretty... Hutu and uh, the bad Tutsi and uh, no. he was really saying shitty things. Right. And um, I knew that he was in prison, uh, but I didn't know that he was considered as a journalist because he's, he's not a journalist <laughs> for me. But he had a card of a journalist, so he counts, right? I'm and sure. uh, um, a month ago, there is another journalist who's been arrested because of the message I told you that she sent on um, in a WhatsApp group. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you have a lot of chance. Your politic, like, you can talk about it, but for our politic, I don't even know sometimes if it's politic. Cause, okay, what do you think sometimes <laughs> when I, when I, when I, <laughs> when I show you like what I just read? Cause sometimes you don't even know, like, we like, well, I know, like, a joke or a, a lot of times you'll, like, uh, you'll play a video. Mm-hmm. of the president speaking. Mm-hmm. And you'll tell me what he's saying, because it's in Kirundi. Mm-hmm. And it's, as far as I can tell, it's just gibberish. <laughs> like, like, it's just a string of nonsensical words linked together, and then they go, and that's why our country is in poor economic status. And you go, that didn't make any fucking sense. Yeah. How did you get from there to there? Yes. <laughs> and... um and we have the privilege to be out of the country to talk and be against that because um, millions of us mm-hmm. are in Burundi and are obliged to applaud. And pretend that that made sense. That it makes sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're talking about a country that's almost going Granted. Back, uh, bankruptcy, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, Has... Sugar shortages, gasoline shortages, power Ex- shortages. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Uh, medications. Medications. Like, uh, uh, every single thing. Like um, even the big societies that we have, like uh, making beers, drinks, oh, and yeah. stuff. Like they are stopping the production because they don't have um, uh, dollars to go and buy what right like there's a literally a shortage of cash right there is a shortage of cash right now yeah. and we have a president who is pretty happy because we are on a good way <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes i i think i pass the level of being sad or mad when i see him because like well what is my first reaction is you time. always laugh you always laugh and go, listen to what this stupid man says. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, well, how, how, yeah, no, 
I I mean, I'm not, it's maybe not quite so clear the parallels with some of the stuff that I complain about in Canada. Like maybe when I'm complaining about like middle of the road centrist type people or what have you, the liberals. But when I'm complaining about conservatives, a lot of times they, they still have those kind of like nonsensical connections. They say this and this and this and this. And that's why, you know, so-and-so and is ruining like, yeah. our country. Uh, Justin Trudeau is a communist. You go, you're a fucking idiot. Yeah, <laughs> like, basically, yeah. So, so I, I, there's parallels, I think, but yeah, maybe not quite as extreme because because they aren't. They are accountable in some ways. Right? Here, yeah, here they are yeah. accountable. For us, we don't know what that word. Yeah, no, we don't know that word. Um, what was it? We don't even have a word in Kirundi. Uh, somebody, about accountability. somebody told you. No, yeah, it was somebody told you that accountability was only for economics. We are trying to teach what is accountability because it's something that's that's not there. It's yeah. not. It's not in the culture. It's not like a in any way like a, t- at the place of accountability. We have um, hate. Hmm. Uh, we have um, blaming of jealousy. Yeah, jealousy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, the reason why you are asking this question regarding this <laughs> politics is because that minister is a Hutu <laughs> or he's a Tutsi. So you are jealous because you are not in power, and so uh. in place of accountability, there is hate, there is jealousy, there is a. Uh, um, competition, you know. Um, yeah, I'm going to be criticizing you so that I can take your place. Right. Because, obviously, it couldn't be because you're bad and doing bad things and bad yeah. at your job. It's because <laughs> I and, want your position in power. And accountability is also a tax, you know. Mm. Yeah. Why would you ask be asking me if I'm, I'm uh, the director of a society that is, you know, a water company? Mm. You don't have water? <laughs> No. <laughs> you don't have water. <laughs> Many people don't have water. I tell you, you will have water in two years. In two years? That's, that's fantastic. In two years. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Why not? Instead of complaining, 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 go find something else to do. While I start, while I die first. <laughs> like accountability. Like it's like a, each time you're saying another word. Yeah. You know, that's w- the idea of yeah. people being accountable is uh is not there yeah it's, it's pretty hard it's yeah. pretty hard like uh i mean obviously yeah you know me i complain about canadian politics because i think there's not actually any real consequences to a lot of these people and there's not as much accountability as there should be but perhaps there's uh yeah. there's something to be said for the at least the amount of accountability that we do have i know that it's uh as an immigrant uh it's really something that took me a long time. I don't even know if I'm still there, honestly. Mm. Uh, but also because it's it's only my fourth country I'm living in. But well, it, t- it took me a long time <laughs> to be interested in Canadian politics because, like, yeah. I honestly, compared to where I've been, yeah, else I'm like, a, it's a nice country. You should yeah. not be complaining that much. <laughs> huh? oh, you could. Lots of trash goes on still. You could be Burundian. So, I guess we're wrapping it up. We're pretty close to an hour now. Yeah. But uh, is there anything that I think, like, is there anything you think of that when you think of, like, this kind of conversation about the politics of different countries? Because I know, like, I didn't know anything about global affairs, really, until we started dating. Yeah, so what would you say that you learned that you didn't Well, learn? I know, I, I didn't know anything about Africa. Like, I really didn't know anything about Africa. <laughs> but now I've had a four-year crash course, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> of somebody who is pretty well-versed in it. That's fair enough. Honestly, I didn't know anything about a Canadian politics either. Yeah. Uh, before coming here in Canada, I knew those two things about the philosophy. Oh, yeah. And that it was cold. But even there, I didn't have the... You didn't know Good quite how cold it gets. <laughs> really? But I guess before we, before we end it, I mm. do actually want to ask you, like, because you said when you first got to Canada, you do almost no English. 
Um, I could read English because I, uh, when I finished my secondary school, uh, I was learning uh, English in mm. secondary school, and um, uh, I could speak English, uh, sort of, when yeah. I finished secondary school. Uh, but I never got the chance to uh, ever speak English after that because I, I was working with uh, the French people in Burundi and then I went in Belgium, which is uh, French. Uh, right. When I got here in Canada, basically, like, the beginning, you if you say that I closed the door without showing me the door to close, mm-hmm. I'll be like... So how did you find yourself in Saskatchewan and learning English and how did you like how did that go like I came for a job yeah yeah it's uh, when I was working for the CBC uh, French in uh, Winnipeg uh, they didn't have a contract um, for me because I I had like a three two times a three months contract and I was looking for a one year contract mm. and um, I would have had to stop working for uh, like two months or something okay uh, or come to work in Regina uh, that I didn't know that I had to look uh, on the map and I was like whatever Winnipeg <laughs> Regina <laughs> you know I'm already in a new country so why not and uh, that's True. how I arrived here and so I was working for the French uh, TV mm. mm-hmm. at first it was pretty hard yeah yeah no working in Canada in an English side as a journalist do you know what it is to go to report on the at the parliament and <laughs> giving your microphone to <laughs> deputies and they'll be talking and I'll be like, oh my God. Hmm. What is he even saying here? Yeah. Trying to read like uh, the you know the press release and you know, I had to be very quick, like uh, on Google yeah. Translate and um, also, you know, uh, cheat on other media and see what they were saying so oh, that yeah. you know I can no, it was, um, at first it was pretty hard, but I was like, hey, I was working. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was like, one day I'm going to be caught. But meanwhile, I'm going to keep doing as if we are understanding everything. Yeah. You know? And then I met you. And they say that uh, it's on the pillow that you learn a language. <laughs> I'm saying everything that you learn, Kirundi, though. <laughs> Because now I'm good in English, so it's yeah, you're, speak you're very Kirundi. good in English. This is yeah. this is the problem because now you're too good in English, so we don't have to communicate <laughs> in any other language. You have a pillow. <laughs> like I, I, I did initially start to learn French, but mm-hmm. and then I thought, well, maybe as the as Mumu gets older, she would learn French and I would learn with her, mm-hmm. and, she, and then she went way past me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so very fast. quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because my old man brain doesn't absorb information as quickly as hers. <laughs> What's the word you know in Kirundi? Imagine I'm I'm about to kill you. <laughs> I think if you don't say your word in Kirundi, you you're dead. Uh, I'm gonna count to five. <laughs> <laughs> One. No, when you sneeze, you say Kira. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one you know. That's the one I know. And when somebody says it to you, you say twice. Yeah, yeah, two words. Yeah, so. You're great. You're great. I used to know the facial features because Mumu and Shiki knew them and were teaching I'm sure that you, you were able I, to find another word of the face. I don't know if I could, but... No? No, it's gone. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so Go then, back to your pillow then. <laughs> Go <right> there. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess... Uh, we're we're at about an hour, so mm-hmm. we might as well call her a night. Would you like to go back to go with me in Burundi? Yes, someday. Okay, yeah. welcome. As long as we're as long as you are not going to get arrested. You can go there without me, actually. I don't want to it's go without pretty, you. Like I, I don't want anybody to think that Burundi is not a country um, that they should go visit. Go visit Burundi, just not without us. Not without me. You can go with Corey and. Uh, <laughs> Our people there are gonna welcome you. Yeah. Very well, but some of us cannot go, and um, that's too bad. Yeah. Well. Yeah. One day. All right. So, my love, mm-hmm. where can people find you on the internet? Uh, they can find me on uh, Instagram, Pamela Kazekare, and on uh, Twitter, Ikigatanya <laughs> Kazi.
All right, and I'm at Skeptical Lefty or at Skeptical Leftist in pretty much all the places. And my website is skepticalleftist.com. See you.